Let's get into it. Symbolic was performed by Chuck Schuldiner on guitars and vocals, Bobby Kobla as well on guitars, Kelly Conlon on bass, and the almighty Gene Hoagland on the drums. And it was recorded in the famous Morris Sound Studios in Tampa, Florida in uh, around 1994. Only Gene and Chuck would remain from individual thought patterns in the band. And something that is interesting on the remastered versions that have come out later is that Steve DiGiorgio, who played bass on individual thought patterns, is on some of the demos here. You can hear what he would have played on the song Symbolic here. And you know, that's not to say that Kelly Conlon did a bad job. He did a perfectly fine and adequate job, but you know, Steve DiGiorgio, he's just one of those bassists that uh, he just, he just adds something extra, something extra, very special to all the songs he plays on. You know, think of the control denied or even a lot of stuff on individual thought patterns like the philosopher or, or trapped in a corner and imagine just what this album would have sounded like with his bass playing on it. But unfortunately he uh, didn't end up on the album, I think for personal reasons. So it's just a small little funny thing and you can hear the demos on, uh, on Spotify and other places like that actually. The production on Symbolic can only be described as crystal clear to me especially in comparison to individual thought patterns. Every pick stroke and intricate drum fill can be clearly heard. Just a wonderful album to listen to, really solely just for the production. Everything is just so crystal clear. Uh, it just It's just so good. I love it. The guitar tone was achieved using the famous Marshall Valve State 8100, of which if anybody in Alberta, Canada is selling one, let me know. And so let us just talk about the drums and the drumming for a second here. Gene Hoagland, the atomic clock himself, put down an absolute clinic on Symbolic. His double ride parts especially are just so innovative and unique, and the production on this album really helps it stand out. On individual thought patterns, it was all kind of a bit muddy, and I find a lot of his uh, very intricate playing would get lost, but in Symbolic, especially in the ending to Symbolic and some of the bridge parts, you can really hear how innovative and creative his drumming was. Just really fantastic work, and I will highlight my favorite drum parts as this video goes on. And I mean, even to this day, with all the crazy drumming I've heard, the tech death, you know, whatever you want, right? Just the drumming on this album always blows me away, no matter what. It's just so good. Chuck would reveal in an interview from 1995 that both him and Gene had much more time to rehearse and practice before recording, and it sure pays off. Gene Hoagland would also state in the interview that the riffs were, you know, not, not all that technical. A lot of guitarists could sit down, play a lot of that symbolic material just right out the gate. And so... That's where I tried to make the drums pretty exciting on Symbolic and try to come with some approaches that had yet to be tried. And Symbolic's more simplistic riffing sort of enabled him to get a little bit more creative and to become a little bit more of the driving force behind the technicality and the intensity of the music. Right, you know, Symbolic's riffs were much more traditional metal than crazy death metal, so really it was up to him to make up for it, and boy, you can really hear it on the song Symbolic here. If you listen, a lot of these riffs aren't that complex or technical, but they're very groovy, and the drumming that Gene Hoagland puts under them really brings up the intensity and gives them that sort of death metal flavor to them, right? The drums really dictate a lot of the stuff that's going on on Symbolic. This song, like many other death songs, follows a very typical song structure that Chuck Schuldiner would use in a majority of his songs, really. Here's a chart I made, and I actually used the song Symbolic in my video on death song structure. So if you haven't checked that out, you can check that out right here. So if we take a look at Symbolic here, we have basically eight distinct parts. An intro, four distinct sections that repeat once, a bridge, and an outro. Intro. Section 1. Section 1 repeat. Section 2. Section 2 repeat. Section 3. Section 3 repeat. Section 4, Section 4 repeat, 
section five, or perhaps in this song you could call chorus. Section five, repeat. Bridge. Bridge slash solo. Outro. But basically, it goes intro, riff one, riff two, riff three, riff four. Then perhaps you'll get a bridge section that may contain in several subsections itself, usually including maybe uh, another line of lyrics or a couple guitar solos before moving back to riff one, perhaps with a little different lyrics, and then riff two, riff three, riff four are usually pretty much almost exactly the same with the same lyrics. It sort of gives the listener several choruses to listen to, if that makes any sense, right? You know, you hear one part that's very catchy through most of the song in a regular song, you know, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus sort of structure. But in this way, especially if your riffs are as good as Chuck Schuldiner's, it really gives uh, lots of stuff to listen to and really makes you want to replay the song over and over again, I find. But yeah, go check that video if you want. And let's get into the intro section right now. The song starts off with a simple yet menacing riff. Played in 3-4 time, the riff repeats a few times as the band slowly joins in and builds up. The symbolic riff here is one of my favorites to play. Not only is it pretty easy, but it just feels and sounds very menacing. That 3-4 time, just, you just lock into the groove there. Oh, it's great. I, I, I really enjoy it. The riff seems and feels very menacing, mostly due to the Phrygian feel that it has. So, you know, we could consider this section to be in the key of D Phrygian, or I suppose you could also co simply call it G minor. The descending power chord arpeggios at the end of the riff provide a nice way to keep the riff sounding interesting, despite the fact that it essentially just repeats the exact same thing throughout the first section for almost a minute. As the band joins in, we get some very interesting drumming from Gene. One could have easily just played a simple beat, and he does a little bit later, but instead, in the first section when the band joins in, Gene plays this sort of beat that almost seems to stumble upon itself and not really get going, if, if you know what I mean. You, here, listen to it. He makes fantastic use of the ride cymbal and the bell all throughout the song, but especially in the intro here. The three, four time really gives a nice stank face inducing groove. However, when the vocals come in, Gene dials back his playing and goes to a more traditional groove that doesn't seem to stumble over itself and continues the, the groove going throughout. Just a nice small little touch that only the best drummers do, knowing when to dial up the intensity and interesting parts, and also know when to simply just play along and, and dial it back and give some other parts and instruments time to shine. Great stuff by Gene here. I don't mean to dwell. As the riff repeats again and Gene dials back his drumming, we get the first vocals from Chuck. His voice is similar in range to individual thought patterns in this sort of, I guess you would just call it a simply like a mid scream rather than his more mid lows that he did earlier and the highs that he would do on the sound of perseverance but in contrast to individual thought patterns where i find him pretty hard to understand lots of the time his diction is extremely clear on symbolic every word is understandable and the timing with the drums is impeccable truly a master class in vocal phrasing especially on the line but I can't help myself as it just falls right in with that descending power chord arpeggio. But I can't help myself. But I feel Another interesting little thing that is very unusual is that the vocals come in on the count of three once the bar with the vocals start, right? So one, two, three, then the vocals come in. Very interesting, you don't really hear it and it gives this sort of a, almost like a laid back groove to the vocals. Very, very cool. The first line of the song are as follows, quote, I don't mean to dwell, but I can't help myself. When I feel the vibe and taste a memory of a time in life where years seem to stand still. Just fantastic lyrics, really, which I find just repeating in my head often as poetry right? You heard me quote it in the beginning of the video as well. The imagery used by Chuck here is also excellent. He explains that even if you attempt to not dwell on the memories from earlier on in life, sometimes you can't help it. 
You can feel the vibes from that time and taste the memories. Maybe something triggers the memories and you spiral deep in thought. You know, taste is not usually a word one would use to describe memories, but Chuck's use of the word here gives it extra power. You know, to have a memory so strong that you can taste it, that's a very interesting way to phrase that line, right? It's like one of those little ear hooks, like you listen to it, oh, interesting, taste a memory, very interesting. You know, I have memories so strong that I can taste them, and I am sure you do as well. It is just an interesting way to explain how profoundly powerful some memories can be. Fantastic opening lyrics here. As Chuck screams out the word still, we get an abrupt tempo change, and now we are in section 2. The band moves up to around 200 beats per minute, goes to 4-4 time, as well as changes keys as well here. Now we're in just D minor natural. The riff here that is played could easily be up there with the greatest of all time from melodic death metal in my opinion. No longer with a Phrygian feel, the band seamlessly moves towards D natural minor, no longer playing the flattened second interval, instead we get the, the regular second interval. A ton of bands owe their careers to riffs like this. One of my favorite riffs to play as well, just it's just really really good. The drums pick up intensity moving towards a more traditional fast death metal groove as well here. And then a very cool drum fill by Gene leads us into the next section of lyrics. Underneath these lyrics and the vocals, Gene once again changes his drums as the vocals come in, this time to a constant eighth note double bass pattern. It adds to the sort of chaos and intensity to the riff, and it just sort of gets lost with all the echoing vocals and everything like that. Just another small touch of uh, Gene Hoagland genius. The lyrics are in section two, quote, I close my eyes and sink within myself, relive the gift of precious memories in need of a fix called innocence. Chuck screams these lyrics over the ferocious and melodic riffs as the vocals echo from left to right. The precious memories he is reliving here are most likely from, quote, when time seemed to stand still, end quote, which combined with the fix of innocence line, it becomes clear that Chuck must be talking about childhood and perhaps even early adult memories when things were new and innocent. He can find comfort in these memories and get his fix of innocence by sinking within himself and his own mind. It is interesting that these lyrics, which seem to reference some sort of internal meditation, come during the most intense and chaotic part of the whole song. A very interesting juxtaposition here. Combining the music with the lyrics, it seems to say to me that despite the chaos around him, while life speeds by, one can find comfort in their own mind and memories, no matter the external chaos, the crazy double bass, the fast riffing, etc, etc, going on around him. Just really fantastic songwriting here by Chuck. One thing I also want to point out here is his vowel choice. Rather than using the E sound like you would when you normally pronounce the word need, he chooses pronounce he chooses to pronounce it more like nade, the nade of a fix called innocence. This ah uh, vocal allows the mouth to open wider, right? Ah, uh, e, ah, uh, e. And when you do the ah uh, vocal, it allows him to project longer. And that's what really gives the innate of a fix called innocence you know it allows chuck to really get that tortured and distressed sound out of his voice here just a very nice touch that i don't think a lot of other people really pay much attention to but chuck children are their genius of course he would as the song moves into section three we get yet another key and tempo change Slowing down slightly, the band moves to what we consider to be B minor. However, this riff, which starts on the flattened fourth interval of the D minor scale, it, which is F sharp. So when moving from D minor to B minor, the band lands on the F sharp five power chord, which sounds very menacing coming out of the D minor scale as it's uh, sort of out of the scale, but still relates to it, right? That's sort of uh, the major third of the D scale right d f sharp that's the major so it gives this very 
interesting way and it just sounds very evil and menacing and it's very you know it's just cool it's just just a cool way to change riffs and keys here the drums back off briefly as we get this very evil and menacing riff which also sees a shift in tone from the lyrics quote when did it begin the change to come was undetectable the open wounds expose the importance of our innocence, a high that can never be bought or sold. Here, rather than finding comfort in his own memories, Chuck begins to lament the loss of innocence, how the loss of it leaves us with open, exposed wounds. Looking back, you can see the loss of it clearly, but at the time it was completely undetectable, and it leaves us wondering, you know, when it all began, the loss of her innocence. Relating these lines to the rest of the song, we get yet another metaphor that relates these precious memories of innocence to a high. Comparing this high of innocence to the sober reality of the present, except this high can never be achieved again. That time is over, forever, no amount of money can ever bring these feelings back, and treating innocence as a commodity will always fail in Chuck's view, as it is something internal which you cannot commodify nor experience the same way ever again. It is a very interesting metaphor to reference innocence as a high. As a high often relates to drugs and other things like that, right? It's a very, very interesting metaphor. These lines are played over a much darker and more malicious riff than the other previous sections, adding to the gravity of these lines. You know, this riff here, it almost seems sort of desperate with the lines that are coming from it too. There's something desperate about the this whole section here. In the next section, which is section four, we see the band shift tempo back up again and yet another key change, this time back to G minor. This riff really isn't all that intense, but the frantic and quite frankly almost absurd drumming of Gene Hoagland here take the intensity up to 10. A great example of the drums dictating the intensity of the riff, as we're really just having a couple power chords, da -da -na -da -da -na -da -na 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 just a couple power chords and a little guitar lick. That's all this is, but it just seems so intense and frantic, especially coming from the previous section's lyrics about innocence and the high of it, compared to this and then the drums. It's just crazy. Like, this is very, very intense stuff, despite the fact that it's not blast beating, it's not, you know, you know what I mean? Just very well constructed music here and of course the double ride work by gene hoagland here is just absolutely amazing this section to me here really represents the chaos that chuck is looking to escape from by reliving his precious memories the chaos and frantic nature of the sober present you could say the section here also is very interesting as the fourth bar of every repeat plays a part which foreshadows the riff which will be played in the next section Some really good songwriting here to subtly introduce the next riff while having this sort of buildup of intensity. You know, it's just really good stuff here, man. Like, I don't know what to say. Just what an excellent song filled with excellent riffs and just excellent songwriting. In section five, or what we could perhaps call the chorus here, I suppose, the band slows down yet again to around 165 beats per minute, landing on that big open D5 power chord before playing a very menacing and evil riff, which again was briefly introduced, albeit at a much higher tempo in the previous section. This riff is just super menacing and dark and evil. It sounds like something is haunting you or chasing you down, and I assume this was very intentional. Listen to the guitar riff when played with a different instrument here and just hear how it almost sounds like boss music, really. The drumming here again is excellent, with Gene Hoagland playing a constant double bass pattern with this very interesting double ride pattern. You know, I'm not sure why other drummers don't really bust out the double ride setups again, but it sounds great when they do, and Gene Hoagland really shows you how creative you can get with it. Yeah. 
the double ride pattern here gives the section some extra rhythmic flair as the double ride flutters, as I guess you could call them, are timed really well with the beats on the guitar riff. Some really, really fantastic drumming, again, not to beat a dead horse, but I just have to say it. The lyrics in this section, or the chorus, I guess, are symbolic acts, so vivid, yet at the same time, we're invisible. Chuck screams these vocals again, and they echo out to the wall of sound made by the crushing, menacing, chasing riff. I believe here that Chuck is again reminiscing on the vivid memories of innocence, the symbolic acts of development in oneself, you could say. Yet during the time when we were experiencing these symbolic acts, our self, or rather our current selves, are invisible. You know, looking back on one's life, there's certainly a feeling of a lack of agency, as the person we are now was invisible in our younger selves. Whether or not this is just memories distorting our perception of these events, or brain development giving us extra clarity of thought is really irrelevant. You know, we're invisible in these sort of symbolic acts and memories anyways. These lines combined with the riff that sounds like you're being chased down is Chuck saying that no matter where you are or who you are, these symbolic acts are always with you, chasing you, haunting you, or as he admits earlier in the song, comforting you. And uh, we'll, we'll sort of wrap up these lyrics and get to the full meaning here a little bit later on, but let's look again here at Chuck's vowel choice. It is very interesting, especially in the word vivid. He pronounced it more like vivod, again allowing him to articulate and project the vowel a little bit better, giving that ah sound allows to project a lot more than i. Eh. Vivid, Vivad allows him to give that sort of crazy unhinged sound that he gets on that word there. For the longest time, you know, the first couple of times I listened to this song, I had no idea he was saying vivid there. I thought he was just saying some completely different word. But, uh, you know, just a, just an interesting way to use some vowels in death metal, which I think a lot of people, when you think of screaming vocals, you know, you don't really pay much attention to vowel choice which is very important in clean singing, but in unclean singing, I think it sort of gets thrown to the wayside a little bit, but Chuck Schildener paid much attention to it, and, well, thank you <laughs> for doing so. Now we move on to the bridge section of the song, again in very typical death fashion, it contains the guitar solos. The band shifts tempos and keys once again, this time to E minor, and we get Chuck's solo. Despite being in the key of E minor, Chuck's solo has a very Phrygian feel to it. The band behind him holds open power chords, allowing the ferocity of his short bursts of notes to really shine. One of my favorite Chuck solos easily. The solo really sounds just sort of uh, frantic and desperate in a way. Bobby's solo follows. The band once again changes tempos and slows down just a little bit. In comparison to Chuck's solo, Bobby's is played over top of a faster eighth note picked palm muted riff. And I always enjoy how in death songs, if there are two solos, you know, one by one guitarist, one by another, they'll usually have different riffs playing underneath it. And Megadeth on Rust and Peace did this a lot too, and it just gives that little extra something to the listener to listen to to differentiate those solos as well, and give a little bit of a different canvas for the guitar solo to be painted upon, if that makes sense. Bobby's solo starts off with some very interesting harmonies, and this very cool descending pattern which he plays across all six strings. His solo was very chaotic and almost frantic, like it is searching for resolution, but it doesn't really come. Very good stuff. As his solo ends, we get the only lyrics in the bridge before the song repeats itself. Savor what you feel and what you see. Savor what you feel and what you see. Things that may not seem important now, but maybe tomorrow. The first line is in call and response pattern to this little guitar lick. It's very cool. And here it seems now that Chuck has expressed his feelings over these symbolic acts of innocence. And now he is asking or perhaps warning us that despite what we think of ourselves today, 
the feelings and things that we do and say today will be the symbolic acts of tomorrow. That small conversation you had with a friend, which may mean nothing to you today, will perhaps become very important to you later on. In fact, this process of vivid memories and symbolic acts is really never ending, which then relates itself uniquely to the song as Chuck's scream of tomorrow sort of rings out into the next bar as the song moves back into section one. You know, it's tomorrow now, we're going to another thing, the riff's back. It's a very, very cool way, and I always like when lyrics relate to the song structure itself, if that makes any sense. Just some good, really good songwriting here by Chuck. The rest of the song is pretty much the same musically and lyrically, the only difference being the lyrics in the section one repeat, which are different from the first time it is performed. Do you remember why? Here Chuck laments, do you remember when things seem so eternal, heroes seem so real, their magic frozen in time? The only way to learn is to be aware and to hold on tight. Man, just bone chilling, fantastic lyrics here. Just gives me goosebumps to read out loud in poem form. Just wow, just so good. Here, similar to the bridge lyrics, Chuck is once again trying to warn us that we are, in fact, today, still forming symbolic acts and vivid memories. The only way to learn is be aware and hold on tight. He reminisces on how the people we look up to are our heroes, who may have seemed to be eternal in our youth, have uh, dimmed over time, as we realize they are simply humans just like us. It is easy to take things for granted as well, to assume that whatever is happening will continue happening forever. But in reality, really, change is the only constant in this world. Chuck is imploring us to wisen up and to hold on tight to the people around us and to the memories we have, as our eternal present life will fade and become new symbolic memories as we move into a new tomorrow, a new reality, a new present. The day today will be tomorrow's symbolic memories and symbolic acts. As the rest of the song repeats, the song then fades out with the menacing chasing riff. And then Gene Hoagland plays really another interesting pattern to end the song here. I really like the sort of uh, the drum fills that he does with the double uh, rides again here. It's just, just Gene Hoagland, man. He's just so good. As the song fades out, it is saying to us that our symbolic acts, memories of innocence, memories of heroes of earlier times is ongoing. It does not stop. It only stops when you stop. So. To sum up what Chuck is telling us in this song, it is that we must be aware and be appreciative of what is currently around us and the people around us. These current events will someday soon become the symbolic acts and vivid memories which we hold so dear to us. We can find solace and comfort in these memories in the chaos of life, but we must also accept that the high of innocence can never be recaptured. So instead of chasing that high of innocence, you have to learn to appreciate the present while being able to relive and to get your fix of innocence, not by attempting to relive things from your past, things from your youth, but reliving them within your own mind mind and holding on to these very precious memories that you have. So you must hang on tight to the vivid memories and make sure to savor what you currently feel as tomorrow these two may just be vivid memories and symbolic acts which you can only re-experience within your own mind. Just fantastic fantastic lyrics and what a fantastic song did i mention this was a death metal song like what other death metal song is approaching lyrics of this caliber truly and this is just really incredibly wise and profound words from a man who was 27 maybe 28 when he wrote this song symbolic stands out as a testament not only to chuck schuldiner's genius as a lyricist but his ability to be a forward thinker in the genre you know symbolic while it may not be the fastest most melodic or heaviest song it still sounds remarkably fresh today. A band could put out the song today and it wouldn't sound, you know, too dated in a sense. Like a fine wine, the song has aged very, very well, especially the production, as well as the lyrical content, really. Just a fantastic song for one of the greatest bands of all time. So, thanks for tuning in, you guys. Be sure to leave a like and a sub if you still haven't yet. 
share with your friend who maybe does not like death yet as it helps all helps the channel grow uh if you're interested patreon will be linked down below join it and we can come chat come chat with me i'll be on it all the time i got discord on my phone i'll chat with you guys no anytime you know i have a lot of content coming up as i'm back for my self-imposed burnout break gave myself a whole month to get a new setup going some new lighting as maybe you could tell here and yeah i'm back we got a lot of stuff going i got a lot of work to cover so hey it's gonna be exciting so make sure you tune in for the ride you guys i really appreciate you all for watching so cheers everyone so long and good night